I'm so glad that John Fluvlog is here to celebrate with us. Uh, do you remember seeing Madonna wear your shoes? Um, I, for, well, this might sound a bit egotistical, but I heard about it, and for years my claim to fame was that I never saw the movie. Mm-hmm. I didn't actually want to go see it or see the, her dangling my shoes in front of the screen. And I think it's just, it sounds backwards and kind of strange, but it was, I think, my own ego. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Did you did you end up seeing it? I have never seen it. Can I show it to you? I have it here. Do you want to see it? Eh, okay. Okay, cool. <laughs> so this is the picture of Madonna with your shoes. Ah, there she is. Thanks, Madonna. Very nice of you. That's very interesting to me that you weren't interested in seeing it. It's a, it was a bit of a big moment, right? It was. Uh, it's a strange idea. I think it's really inverted egotism. I, I, I've, I've liked, I know a lot of famous or interesting people have worn my shoes over the years. And I don't really like thinking about it because I like the idea that I am here today and still in business because of everyday people that wear my shoes and walk in my stories. And I am so thankful for them. I'm going to get you to do something that might be a little challenging for the radio, but if anyone can do it, I think it's you. Can you, can you describe Fluvog shoes to me on, on the radio, how, how they're different from other shoes? Well, they come from me. So um, I spent my career finding out um, who I was. So my career and uh, my personality are kind of the same. They're not two diff- two separate things. Like I don't have my business over here and I'm over here. Mm. So the things that I created were things that came out of me. Uh, there are varying times in my life. If if you ever read my book, it's like I've been through a lot. Of, I've been up times. I've been down times. I've been nearly bankrupt. But I've been real, hopefully. And, and I put that feeling or that emotion into my shoes. I put messages on the bottom of my shoes sometimes. And they're just what I'm going through at that time. Um, and I like to think that, that when we express ourselves as humans, when we have the uh, freedom to do that, when we're not just trying to be something or something that we've seen somewhere else, but we're truly authentic, that that comes through. And so I hope that authentic, that authenticity comes through um, in my footwear. And trust me, I, I find it a bit odd sometimes that people uh, take the shoes to a different place than I thought even they would. They get what really into it. What do you mean by that? They, they, they get obsessed with them. They get yeah. collecty about they, them. They collecty about them. Yeah. They're collecting them. They get obsessed by them. They know all the names more than I do. Yeah. Uh, they talk about them. They come up to me, oh, John, I love your shoes. Do you remember that? You know, I've got this. And they name a name. And I'm going, oh, I, I look interested, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember. But, uh, yeah, they get right into it. So it, it has taken on a life of its own. So let's talk a little bit about that life you mentioned. So you grew up in Vancouver. Were you, did you grow up in a partic- were you particularly artistic growing up? No. Well, that's a story. So here is this kid who grew, grows up in Burnaby, which is a suburb of Vancouver. Um, not good at school ever, a little rebellious, a little reckless, um, the kind of guy that, you know, even <laughs> at the age of six would ride his tricycle on two wheels kind of thing. Um, I grew up in an ice cream drive-in, which sounds pretty weird, but it was a hangout for teenagers in the 50s. So I grew up with all of the, all of the feelings of the 50s, and every season, haircuts would change, styles would change change the way people what people did to their cars would change they you know reverse the rims and I was into Mm -hmm. so I got into sort of the culture of teenage culture I kind of it kind of got into my psyche I guess I kind of yeah and I I remember rock and roll I remember first hearing uh, 1956 I remember uh, things like don't step on my blue suede shoes Mm -hmm. I remember that being played on the car radio in the dry in the ice cream drive and how old am I? I'm like eight or something. And it was like, bam, that's cool. Yeah. So, so what, what was the plan? What, what did you think your life was going to turn out to be? Oh, I had no idea. I was really aimless, uh, completely aimless, I have to say. Uh, being a little dyslexic, I didn't get into uh, university. Mm. Uh, and I'm feeling like a little insecure, obviously, um, thinking, well, a part of me kind of gets it. I know what's going on. Like you understand what's going on. I understand and, what's going on. Like I got the feeling. I got yeah. the emotion. It's yeah. like I played the trumpet and band, but I couldn't do the notes very well, but it's a good trumpet player. Yeah. So, you yeah. know. Yeah. 
Um, so you so, um, so you go to I want to jump to 1969. You're in your early 20s. 69. I am. Yes, I'm in my early 20s. You just go got home to BC after a summer away in California. Yeah. Still feeling a little bit lost. Yeah. And then one day you meet someone who sort of changes everything. Yeah. We all have. We all meet people, and we all have you know definitive moments. Uh, Who's that? Well, it was, it was a guy named Peter Fox. And so he's really more of a friend of my father's. So I met him and he said, well, why don't you come down and uh, I'll give you a job working uh, in my shoe store uh, in downtown Vancouver. So I go down, I get interviewed actually by his aunt and everyone thought that I was very arrogant, which I was, um, <laughs> and, but they hired me anyway. <laughs> and so I, I'm there for a few months um, and Peter mentioned to me, I'm thinking about going on my own, starting my own business, and do you want to come with me? Right. And I'm just a kid, and I'm thinking, sure. Um, I was making 55 or 60 bucks a week back Pre then. Pretty good. Pretty good, yeah. yeah. I was rolling in a dough. Yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> well, for back then, it's pretty good, I'm it sure. It wasn't. Honestly, that was not good money. Even I just then. assume when anyone ever tells me about money from back yeah. then, what, like, what I'm supposed to do is go, wow. Yeah, wow. That's wow. amazing. You know, yeah, like, right, no. And chips cost two cents. Wow. Yeah. No. Wow. You know? No, it was a barely <laughs> livable wage even back then. <laughs> okay, good. And I'm thinking, well, I, I got nothing else to do. So anyway, one thing leads to another. Uh, we go see my father, who is not a wealthy man, but he's a saver, uh, went through the depression, that kind of thing. And so he says to Peter, yeah, I'll lend you this $13,000 if you make my son a 50% partner. And I suppose that's pretty defining. Yeah. So suddenly I'm in business with a man much, uh, 15 years my senior, lots of experience, and I'm just a kid. Um, and on the upside, I was honest. Yeah. I came to work every day. Yeah. Um, Did you have an aptitude? Did you, do you, looking back, do you think you had an aptitude for shoes at that time? It's not about shoes. I had an aptitude for feelings and emotions. And maybe I understand how people feel. And I would say, if anything, I ended up being in the feel-good business. So I make people, my job is really making people feel and walk in stories and make them feel good and make them feel a little different. But that's something you noticed there. You were there and you went, you know what? Every, this guy's here selling loafers. I know, I know something else is going on here. Well, there's a reason why we buy things. There, there are reasons behind reasons. Um, they're multi-layered. They're not all one thing. We purchase things as an identity thing. And I, maybe I innately understood that. I don't think I ever came and said that to myself one day, but that's what happened. So I go, I go am I jumping ahead too much here? No. Yeah. 10 years goes mm -hmm. by, I'm mm -hmm. with him. And then I, he, he goes out on his own and I'm by myself. Mm -hmm. And I had to uh, scramble around and do cash flows. I did the marketing, uh, uh, you know, the HR, all the things one does in a small business. I was going to Europe and buying shoes, coming back, trying to sell them and figure the whole thing out. And it was a stretch for my little brain, I yeah. guess. And also at the same time in the early 80s, there was a recession. So all those things combined to like around 1985, I was pretty close to bankrupt. I probably was. Yeah. Uh, and I had a decision to make. I had two stores in Vancouver, one losing money every month and, month and another one making money. I'd started to get into the punk scene, was selling a grunge and punk. Thing. That was actually going fairly well. And you saw that coming? I mean, that was that was a little before grunge. It was about it was. Uh, seven, six years before grunge. Yep. And even a couple of years after punk started, sort of started. But so punk had kind of started to dip away a little yep. bit. New wave would come in. You obviously saw something there. Well, I saw the, sh <laughs> I saw that the shoes were selling. <laughs> <laughs> no, come on now. Yeah, really. You saw that there was, there was, I mean, you saw that there was a market there. You saw that there was at least an aesthetic choice there. You saw that yeah, people were making a certain kind of choice, perhaps before others did. Yeah, of course. Yeah. There you go. Of course I did. And, and I, I like the feeling that it gave people. I like the fact that they walked in these stories and that they had, a, a, you know, an identity. Um, and I like giving people an identity. And I like the fact that they're a bit rebellious. And I like the fact that other, uh, most other retailers or people didn't understand what was going on. And that, um, that makes me feel good. I like that. Like, tell me, tell me but I'm, I'm so interested in what, to, I, I'm really loving everything you're telling me about understanding what people want, understanding what people want about what they want. But I'm also interested in just what inspired you aesthetically. I mean, your shoes have such a, a kind of a wide array of, of different styles, but they're, they all seem very characteristically you to me. I don't know a whole lot about shoes, but they do. And I was just wondering, in terms of just pure aesthetics, what was inspiring you? 
as, as, as the, the designer of the shoes. Yeah. Um, again, my business has been uh, a way of me getting to know myself. It forced me to get to dig into myself and find out and do things that were beyond what I thought I could do or was capable of. So when I did that, I sort of leaned back and went, go, well, I started to go, well, what affects me? What is it about what people are wearing or doing affects me? What grabs my attention? And I suppose when I, when I really took the boldness to look at that, certain things would pop into my mind, um, images. And I, when, I, uh, when I looked at people, I saw what I wanted to see mm. rather than what I saw. And, and I thought, well, if only they had this on or they did this or they wore it this way or that way. And then I just acted on those impulses. I guess I had the boldness to do it. And maybe it's another thing. I had nothing to lose. I went, you know, yeah. Is there? Is there? Can you? So when you look at this book now, when you look at these these uh, all these shoes that you've designed over the years, can you look at them and go, "That's that's this side of me, or that's that part of me?" Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Can you give me an example? Um. Uh. Well, the messages of certainly the messages on the souls are a part of me. Um. There's a rock and roll side of me. There's a sort of a coquette side of me. There's a cute side of me. Um, there's a utilitarian side of me. I have, like all of us, I'm, mass, uh, I'm multifaceted as a person, not all one thing. And I, I personally never got into um, all the eras that I've been through. So you have to think I started out in, uh, let's say, I, really in the 70s, yeah. early 70s, hippie stuff. And yeah. then I went to disco. Yeah. And disco fades out and then it goes... Um, into the bland early 80s, I call it, or it was misery. Um, <laughs> and, then, and then it's sort of, I was, in all through all these eras I've been through, I personally have never really jumped into it, as it were, or sold my soul to it. Mm -hmm. I, um, I walked beside it and I observed it. And I think when I look at uh, people that are in the fashion industry and who are really good at it, uh, when you meet them and see them, it's kind of... It's interesting because they are not uh, what you might think of being uh, the magazine image of what their brand is. They're quite different. Right. And, um, and I think I've always – I think that's an important part of doing what I do is not to be uh, so taken with the genre or image that I'm putting out but to be an observer. Well, you know, it's interesting to me. If you're just tuning in, my name is Tom Power. I'm here with the great Canadian shoe designer, John Fluvog, who's celebrating 50 years in business, or as his new book puts it, 50 years of designing unique souls for unique souls. But we've been talking a little bit about how these shoes are in so many ways a reflection of John himself and his own worries, his insecurities, his, the sides of him, the multifaceted sides of him, uh, all sides of him and all sides of humanity. But that doesn't keep us from talking about well, some very famous people who have worn the shoes like this. Take a listen. No more, Mr. Nice Guy. No more, Mr. Green. No more, Mr. Nice Guy. They say he's sick. He's a C. -E -E. That's Alice Cooper with No More, Mr. Nice Guy. Alice Cooper, big fan of the, the flu bogs. Yeah, right? yeah, it's been for years. Yeah. That's pretty good. Yeah, pretty cool. For someone who I can tell is not incredibly overwhelmed by a celebrity, there has to be someone that you, they wore your shoes and you went, oh, that's kind of uh, cool. Um, I, I would say, <laughs> yeah, sorry, you're squeezing me in a box here. Okay. I no, would, no, no, no. If, if the answer's no, the answer's no, that's fine. But I got to imagine deep in your heart of hearts. Well, like, it's a variety of people. It would be like uh, Beyonce. I mean, I... I it's pop, it's, I see them like little stars that fall on me and I'm so thankful for them. You know, and I, I know that the, that star power has so much um, power and that when they do fall on me as a little lowly shoe designer, it, it's important. And so I'm very thankful for that. So um, I think people like Alice Cooper um, have, because they're, 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 he's, he's my age and he's been doing it for the same length of time I've been doing it. So that is kind of cool to me. 
Um, is that is that is that the trick to, to staying relevant? I mean, I still I see people wear your shoes now who are you know, hip Instagram models who are like you know twenty twenty one years old. Is is the reason the shoes are so timeless is because they come from that sort of emotional side of you that you don't follow the trends. You do follow sort of what's what's inside you. Like how do you how do you avoid being boxed into an era? Yeah. Well, I think I think whenever um, if we want to be good at art, if we want to hear creation. If we want to bring creation down and reinterpret it, it has to come through who we are as a person because we are made, each one of us is very unique. There's never been another person made like us, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And it's, I think it's really, if I could say anything and if my book says anything to people, it's that they're okay and their thoughts are okay and go ahead and take the boldness and express who you are in what you do. Um, that's my story, actually. That's my maybe my theme or my song. In, in addition to the stories about the famous people we, we've talked about, and we don't have to talk about them again, but, I, but there are some really beautiful stories in this book about, you know, married couples who met because of their shared love of, of flu vogs. Yeah. That must be, that must feel all right. It does. Um, there are Facebook pages that have popped up, uh, that are independent of the company, um, and they have little online love fests about the shoes, and it feels pretty good, and also feels a little weird. So, uh, you know, it's 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 two things to me. Um, probably the thing that when I meet people, I often hear them say, "Oh, John, I love your shoes. Um, you got to keep on doing it." It's like, really? <laughs> <laughs> I do. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, yeah. How you so, feel, how are you feeling about that? How do you feel about keeping going another fifty years? Yeah, uh, that's not going to happen. Uh. And uh, it, in a way, I have to you know to really to be very honest, it is a job. It's it's a job to be creative. It 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 does it comes naturally, but it also is is work. Um, you have to um, you have to pull it down. I I do feel like a conduit. Like, I don't actually, it's not really me. But is that it is. so? You feel like there's something kind of speaking through you when yeah. you design these shoes? A hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. Things come to me. I see them in like a vision. I see them in a, sh I, um, I, they, I won't say, I use the word, they get revealed to me. Yeah. Bob Dylan used to say that. Bob Dylan used to say, he would listen back to his songs and go, I, I, someone else must have wrote that. Uh-huh. And, and I, uh, I agree with that. I look at shoes and I go, I did those? How did, how did I come up with that? That's amazing. Or, you know, I, I do think that. So I'm a big believer in, in hearing. I think we all can hear. And that the creative is all around us, but we just need to bring it down. So but talk to me about the idea of belief. You said, you know, you almost went bankrupt. You pretty much were bankrupt is what you, what you said to me. That is a moment where a lot of people would stop and go back to business school and work at the Ford plant doing, you know, yeah. doing the books. Yeah. What, what kept you going? Because I think a lot of people who are in artistic fields like you, but artistic, artistic fields that are also balanced with commerce, there comes a point where they can stop. Yeah. Uh, there has been a few points in my career. Um, falling in love was a good one. Uh, that kept me going. It just energized me. Um, I had a time when uh, I was pretty well done emotionally. Um, and I was, I, I had actually made a decision to give it all up. And I had somebody come and visit me and give me like a, they, they gave me a vision of what my name would be and what my shoes could be. Hold on, what? Tell me the story. Ah, okay. Um, one particular day, November, probably about now when we're talking, it was rainy and cold and wet and miserable. I just opened a Seattle store and things had kind of taken off at, in a mini way in Seattle. Um, but I'd, I I'd basically was, I had run out of money and so sales started to dive and I just ran, I emotionally ran out of juice. Yeah. Um, and I said to my then wife, I said, look, I, I got to find another source of income because I need to feed my family, pay my mortgage, all the things one has to do. Yeah. And I get to work, and a friend of mine called me and said, I'm sending somebody down to see you, some guy from Arizona. He's got this gift. I said, oh, really? Okay. So along comes a man who 
walks in, who looks like he just got out of a Ford hot rod in the 80s, you know, jacked up car. He had long hair and blue jeans. And and he sits me, he, I start talking. He said, I don't want to hear about what you're doing. He said, here, just sit on a chair. And he sits me down in his chair and he kind of, he starts to, um, maybe the word would be pray over me or just lays his hands on me. He said, oh, and he starts seeing pictures. He said, oh, I see these pictures. And he said, I see shoes, and I see shoes in different places. And, um, oh, I see your name. And he said, your name's going to be quite powerful. And he said, oh, well, what's your name? Like, he didn't know who it was. Yeah. And that caught my attention. It's like, oh, you know. Mm-hmm. And I'm not really into that sort of idea. It's yeah. sort of very airy-fairy to me, and yeah. I'm a little, like, yeah. skeptical. But something caught my attention about what he said. And then he said, I, saw the, I see these shoes in different places. And I say, he said, I see different shoes. Oh, these are like crazy shoes. And he's like, he was like watching a movie of my life. And that event gave me the courage to keep on going. Um, he said, put your name on everything. Your name's going to be powerful. Um, was he like a healer? What was he? Was he like a, a, a psychic? Well, let's, let's call it prophetic. Right. Have you, ever, have you ever come across him again? Yeah, I have here and there. He's passed away now. Um, he was probably a little younger than me, um, and an odd character. But it sounds like you, you derived some faith, some meaning. Some... I did. Yeah, yeah, it was, I always say it was somebody needed to hit me on the head to carry on, and I, I, this person got sent to me to do it. Uh, maybe it's because I wasn't hearing very well, or I, was, I didn't have the courage on my own. So I, I got kind of hit over the head, as it were, um, by this guy from the outside. It was, it was an incredible experience. So I've had a few different things happen to me, but that's, uh, that's obviously now a long time ago. But it, it, um, it was a defining moment, put it that way. I think a lot of people listening to this right now are, are maybe finding themselves in, in moments like that. What's, what's your advice to them? To believe that they are okay, that they are a created person, and what they're thinking is fine, uh, they uh, nothing's. Uh, they weren't made incorrectly. You were made correctly. When I go on, one of the reasons I wrote the book was it, it's really a story of me thinking maybe something is wrong with me because I'm you know I can't uh, perform like other people can because of my dyslexia. But it's not. It's okay. And you're okay. You're made well. You're made correctly. There's been no mistake. And just believe it. Nice to talk to you. Thank you for coming in. Thank you so much.